And I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion in her name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, last week I attended the 23rd Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Bonn, the COP, COP23. The conference was a platform for me to showcase Scotland as a global leader in tackling climate change, as indicated by our commitment eight years ago to reduce our 2020 emissions by 42%. But here in Scotland, of course, the climate impacts are already evident. In future, climate change is likely to exacerbate the frequency and severity of flood events in Scotland. This risk and actions to address them are set out in Scotland's adaptation programme. Today's debate is an opportunity to review our progress in reducing flood risk and to, uh, uh, to identify continuing challenges. Climate change increases the future likelihood of flooding, but of course in many areas it is already a current reality. Its impacts are devastating beyond description, and I've seen this on too many occasions in my own constituency. We're now approaching the second anniversary of Storm Desmond, during which we saw some of the most significant flood events for some time. Reducing flood risk is recognised in the programme for government because of the devastating impacts of flooding. But the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act, introduced in 2009, is specifically tailored towards delivering a risk-based and plan-led approach to flood risk management in Scotland. And as I look about me, I realise that there are not that many members left in the chamber who will recall that, although I can see that John, is, uh, John Scott is indicating that he remembers it very well. Um, it was an important piece of legislation because it provides the basis of an improved modern framework which moved away from tackling flood risk on the previous ad hoc reactive basis. Importantly, this act uh, also allocates clear roles and responsibilities for flood risk management in Scotland. So that provides clarity for the public and the foundation for successful partnership working. It's this partnership working which includes local authorities, SEPA, Scottish Water and others, which led to the preparation of the 14 flood risk management strategies published in 2015. And they provide the first ever national plan for flood risk management in Scotland. They set out the short and longer term ambition for flood risk management uh, in the country. And across the 14 strategies, there are 42 formal flood protection schemes or engineering works proposed for the period 2016 to 2021. And the total number of properties that could be protected by these schemes or works is projected to be 10,000. Since 2008, the Scottish Government has made available funding of £42 million a year to enable local authorities to invest in flood protection schemes. Last year, an agreement was reached between Scottish ministers and COSLA on a new strategic funding plan for flood protection schemes. The agreement guarantees that for the next 10 years, the level of flooding capital grant within the local government settlement is set at a minimum of £42 million a year. And that agreement between the government and COSLA is absolutely vital to the good working uh, of the uh, flood risk, uh, um, the Flood Management Act. Is, yes, of course. Stuart Stevenson. Um, <coughs> is the, minister, the Cabinet Secretary aware in Murray, in Elgin in particular, what a dramatic difference uh, has been made by the new flood prevention scheme there? And my colleague Richard Lockhead and my Murray constituents are very welcome for the support that's been given. Cabinet Secretary. I well remember the uh, terrible flooding um, that uh, Elgin experienced. As it happens, I think it was me that signed off on the plan in the first place. And it is a testament to the length of time it takes that these get put into place, that I, uh, back in the same role, actually opened formally uh, the plan, uh, uh, the flood risk works, uh, the, the flood works um, more recently. And I know what a difference it makes when uh, when this happens. I know how important it is uh, for individuals, businesses and communities um, in areas like Elgin uh, when they see uh, this work uh, taking place. A key part of increasing resilience, of course, has been the development of the Scottish Flood Forecasting Service, which is a partnership between SEPA and the Met Office. It provides local responders with a five-day outlook of potential flood risk 
Responders have highlighted that this is an invaluable tool, allowing them to identify when they need to be ready and gives an indication of the likely duration of the event. And it means responders can consider resources and decide when recovery efforts may be required. SEPA also operates Floodline, which has now over 26,000 customers. Receiving a flood warning through Floodline gives householders time to take action, such as installing floodgates or considering alternative travel plans. Now, last night's weather showed the value of this investment. SEPA were actively engaged uh, to support responders in the north of Scotland. Flood warnings were issued to the community in Easter Ross and the Great Glen. This effort will continue overnight given further rain is expected. Now, alongside, the Scot uh, alongside this, the Scottish Flood Forum has helped communities to build flood resilience and assist those who have unfortunately been flooded. The Scottish Government provides financial support for the forum, enabling it to offer free advice about property level protection measures. And if anybody has had flooding events in their constituency, they will know that the flood, Scottish Flood Forum are there on the ground almost immediately to give that help. Historically, his whole, householders in flood prone areas had difficulty getting affordable flood insurance. The launch of Flood Re in 2016 was a major milestone ensuring that household flood insurance remains widely available and affordable. And can I encourage all members to raise awareness in their own areas uh, about the free services offered through Floodline and the Flood Flo uh, Forum and the availability of Flood Re. It's really important that people know uh, that these things are available to help them. Another part of our success in flood risk management has been Scotland's leading role in piloting and developing approaches to natural flood management. We're supporting the long-term Edelston Water Project, which is developing an evidence base to improve our understanding and to encourage practitioners, planners and land managers of the case for natural flood management. Needless to say, uh, uh, some of the money which we've been using to do this uh, um, uh, uh, through Interreg um, has been coming from the EU and I'm just a little concerned about the availability uh, of funds like that uh, in the future. We are making progress. We've got a clear programme of work to do. It is ambitious, but we must recognise that there are still challenges to face. I don't want to pretend that this is a fix for absolutely everything. And one of these big challenges is along our coasts, rising sea levels, increased coastal erosion and erosion enhanced flooding will progressively impact Scotland's soft coastlines, its assets and communities. So a first step in getting a better understanding of coastal erosion was provided by the Dynamic Coast Project I launched in August. We now know that we can expect faster and more extensive erosion than we've been used to, increasingly affecting all asset types, buildings, infrastructure, cultural and natural heritage. So we have a window of opportunity to plan, mitigate and adapt in advance of greater impacts, but this is going to require cross-sector and integrated adaptation and mitigation planning. And one of the greatest... Yes. Liam Kerr. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the intervention. Uh, one way to address coastal erosion at Montrose might be a sand engine. Uh, is the Scottish Government investigating this as an option? And if not, why not? And if so, will the Scottish Government commit to covering the cost? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm well aware of the difficulties uh, uh, that take place at Montrose, and I know a great deal of work is currently undergoing to identify the best options for dealing with the problem there. Whether the one uh, that Mr Kerr raises is that option, I can't answer because that work has not yet been done. So I, I think what's important is for us to establish how to, how to deal with the problem uh, and, then, uh, and then move on from there. So one of the greatest impacts on the, hel uh, the health of those who experience flooding is having to leave their homes. Preliminary results from social impact study we commissioned uh, after the Aberdeenshire 2015 floods show that two thirds of respondents were in temporary accommodation for more than six months. The impact on daily lives, financially and socially, is enormous. So the challenge here is to ensure that if or when the property floods, again, the building is more resilient to flood water. We must start to think about making changes following a flood. We can't aim to go back to normal. We must aim to go back to better. So we're working with stakeholders, including the building and insurance industries, to develop an action plan to promote the need for flood-resilient properties. This can mean introducing resilient materials and using different construction methods to our homes and business premises. The outcome is often less damage to the building, less cost and less time spent in temporary accommodation. So it's important that this uh, work is done. 
Uh, all of the information that we're gathering helps us to better understand social vulnerabilities associated with flooding, allows SEPA to take account of this in their flood risk assessments and action prioritisation method methodology. So it's also a powerful tool for local authorities. We also need to uh, spend some time considering surface water management and connected to that sewer flooding, an issue I know is dear to John Scott's heart, uh, at it, as the sewerage network is a combined system draining both sewage and surface water from properties and roads, sewer flooding can occur following heavy rainfall events. There are a number of reasons uh, for this, uh, although the vast majority of those reasons uh, tend to relate to people putting inappropriate objects into the sewer system in the first place. Something like 70% of the events that happen in terms of sewer flooding are caused by that. So we, we need a, a bit of work to be done uh, around that. Uh, Presiding Officer, I know I'll be coming to the end of my remarks. Uh, we are constantly aware that flooding is a traumatic event causing damage, destruction uh, and distress to communities, individuals and businesses. We can't always stop it, but we can make sure we are prepared to do what we can to reduce the risk and where it occurs, support those affected. We're making progress. We have together delivered the first set of flood risk strategies and are supporting their delivery. There's an enormous amount of leadership gone into this. I recognise that. Huge amount of uh, collective engagement. Uh, I recognise that as well. The legislation that I've referred to introduced a brand new approach to what was there before. It's been innovative. It's been an amazing journey from the Act to the first national flood risk assessment and on to the strategies in their delivery. And I look forward to future engagement with partners over the second flood risk management planning cycle uh, as we look to what the future brings uh, with regard to this particular problem. Thank you very much. I call on Edward Mountain to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And at the outset, I'd like to declare an interest as a partner in a farm partnership and an interest in a wild salmon fishery. I welcome today's debate on working in partnership to reduce flood risk across Scotland. And I'd like to state at the outset that the Scottish Conservatives will be happy to support the government's motion. However, we feel it's vital, considering the increasing rate of climate change, that the Scottish Government should consider all measures of slowing down water transfer from land to river and throughout the catchment. This is reflected in our amendment, which I would like to move at this stage in my name. Each and every one of us knows how much flooding can devastate the lives of our constituents, with damage to property, destruction of crops, disruption of energy supplies, and in certain cases with tragic co consequences with the loss of life. Whilst no government can stop all flooding, governments can and must find practical methods to manage flood water. Now, King Canute proved you can't stop the tides, and we need actions, not words, when it comes to flooding. Therefore, managing floods, which we accept is a centuries-old battle which humans have often fought and often lost because they underestimate the power of water. Furthermore, as climate changes, we now need to take account of flash floods, which, by, which are by their nature very unpredictable. The combination of flash floods and high tides mean that pouring concrete and armouring riverbanks, while a visible solution, seldom provides the best answer. We need to look further afield for solutions, managing floodplains to allow them to do what they are supposed to do, and not for used for housing would be just a good start. I want to look briefly at Inverness. CEPA estimates the average cost of, of flood damages in Inverness stands at £5.6 million. Therefore, I welcome the Inverness Flood Alleviation Scheme, which was made possible by the Flood Risk Management Act of 2009, and it will protect 800 homes and 200 businesses in the city. However, communities and business in Inverness are rightly concerned that the costs have spiralled by £3.1 million over the original budget. That's nearly a 9% increase on the planned cost. Residents rightly expect and want the best flood protections, but at the best price, and lesson needs to be learned from that scheme. Often, the most expensive scheme is not the best option. Now, we need to be realistic. And I'm pleased to see that there is now an acceptance that flood prevention can be a combination of sometimes speeding up the flow of water down watercourses, as well as delaying the speed that water gets into those watercourses. Now, this acceptance means we need to consider, for example, forestry and whether it can play a part. Do forests speed up drainage? Probably. Soil pans under trees and ditches keep waters from trees and are needed in forestry plantations. Planting 
and harvesting, however, often creates vertical tracks that become good natural drains. Good practice should have stopped this, but I see plenty of examples of this round the countryside when I'm driving round the highlands and islands. Water moves too quickly now through woodlands and down to watercourses, therefore increasing risk not only of flooding, but of acidification and silt deposit, de deposits. Now, I also say, mention, would like to mention the EU agricultural policy. It has always prioritised farming with pan-European objectives. With the UK leaving the European Union, we now have an opportunity to redesign our agricultural support systems. So, so perhaps we should be looking at subsidies, which also allow farmers to be compensated if their land is used as emergency planned flooding catchment areas in times of high rainfall. Now, it seems to also to be fashionable to point the finger of blame at flooding at the manage of, management of upland areas. What is important in the management of these areas is that we have a range of habitats. To be technical, it requires plagioclimax and climax vegetation, as well as pioneer vegetation. This needs management, and experience tells me that Muirburn pays a part in this. Furthermore, we need to ensure that the uplands are grazed in such a way as to prevent prevent damage to fragile soils and peat bogs. That means control of all grazing animals, not just deer. A holistic and balanced approach is what we need. Now, I'd also briefly like to mention watercourse management. Experience tells me that by allowing rivers to shallow with gravel deposits or clogged up with weeds means that they can hold less water. It's really that simple. Surely it's time to investigate whether dredging of rivers should be viewed as a natural and effective management tool in the same way that we view the, uh, the dredging of ditches and drains. Now, I'd also like to mention the management of water. Perhaps we need to rethink the management of our locks and reservoirs. For example, if one looks at Loch Ness, having the ability to rise the water in Loch Ness at times of high rainfall would prevent flooding downstream. To give you a really simple example, if the height of rock Loch Ness was raised by just two inches, it would mean that, that in, those two inches would be spread over 56.4 square kilometers. It would be a massive sink holding the drain, uh, sorry, holding the water before it drains down into the river. I'll leave you to do the maths, but I can tell you it's a huge amount of water and it would have reduced flooding in, in Inverness. Now, it's also become fashionable, and rightly so, to increase the use of green energy. Wind turbines, which cover much of, uh, many of our hills, provide clean and green energy. But be under no illusion, they add to the flooding risks. You should not forget that under each turbine, there's 250 to 420 cubic metres of con concrete to hold them up. That means that each turbine base removes the same amount of peat, or sponge, if you will, because concrete doesn't absorb water. It's not just that. Wind farms need good access tracks, miles and miles of them. Roads cause water to be pushed into drainage ditches, and drainage ditches flow down in water courses, which is a true example of speeding up the water reaching our rivers. Are we perhaps managing that in the best way we can? Presiding officer, I'm sure that the Scottish Government recognises that it's not about how much concrete you pour, or how high you build defence walls, or how deep you dredge a river. If a tidal surge and there's hard rainfall, then we must make space for the water with no, more natural management schemes to slow down the, re, the speed that water reaches the choke points, and more importantly, the speed it reaches our urban conurbations. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call Claudia Beamish to speak to move the amendment in her name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour will be supporting the Scottish Government motion today with its emphasis on partnership working and the respect that it shows for it. However, our own amendment is intended to highlight some issues which need to be addressed on an ongoing basis if we are to truly tackle the flooding challenges we will face together over the coming years. I move our motion in my name at this point. We will also be supporting the Tory amendment uh, with the um, with the climate change focus uh, that it has today. Over the last two weeks, climate change has been placed at the centre of global diplomacy, and indeed the Cabinet Secretary was attending um, the deliberations in Bonn. The Paris Agreement saw us 
reach international, international consensus that climate change is our shared threat and responsibility. But now that the international community um, has, has spoken on this, it must deliver on those promises. And the nationally determined contributions, known to be insufficient, must be re-examined for greater ambition and equity. This year, the world has faced a deluge of extreme weather caused by climate change, the cost of which is estimated to be uh, $200 billion. While Scotland has hunkered down for the tail end of some hurricanes, the country's main threat from a changing climate is heavy rainfall and subsequent flooding. And since 1961, Scotland's average annual precip precipitation rate has risen by 27%. Our amendment stresses that there must be adequate research commissioned to assess the implications of climate change on flooding policy. Let me give you an example. The UK Committee on Climate Change highlighted that barriers to agroforestry must be addressed. Aileen McLeod wrote to me in early 2016 stating, whilst we don't have specific research on the impact of low density woodland associated with agroforestry systems, we will still expect woodlands of this type to be beneficial for water management. Further research is needed and indeed may well be happening, but I, I make this point to emphasize that we must identify ways in which uh, protection and better flood management can be based on science. Regularity of reviews of planning and mapping and other flood-related strategies is also essential. Planning has a part to play when considering working in partnership to reduce flood risk. I have an example from my own region where agricultural permitted development rights were used uh, to inappropriately exploit the planning system, in my view, in respect to, uh, to flood risk. As such, applications do not need planning permission and SEPA has no remit. So SEPA expressed to me their concern about a decision to grant a housing application on appeal, but recognized, of course, that due process had been followed. They stated, it is our judgment that, that the proposal constituted development within an under, undeveloped, sparsely developed floodplain as identified by the 200-year flood extent and therefore was unacceptable as the land, land raising works undertaken by the applicant resulted in the loss of floodplain storage and conveyance. This loophole in challenging times for flooding issues should be addressed sooner rather than later. And further, our amendment recognises that no communities, whether urban or rural, should be left behind in these developments. Action must be inclusive and support those in challenged communities, small as well as large. Very briefly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I wonder if the member will share with me that there are also concerns about farmers and others putting in drainage that causes floodplains that are naturally there to dry out so that at a later date, if water has to go on to them, the hard ground is less able to absorb the water. So it's a very difficult and interlocking set of issues here. Claudia Beamish. I absolutely agree with the member, and it is a point well made. And there also, there's also, on a much smaller scale, the issue of um, concreting over um, driveways in, in gardens as well. Um, but the 10-year uh, funding for potentially vulnerable areas uh, will be vital to help national scale flood issues. However, not all locations at flood risk are eligible for this funding, including small groups of less than um, 50 properties. And uh, th this is the case of Cast Fen in Dumfries and Galloway, which is regularly hit by flooding. Uh, the First Minister in 2016 gave a commitment to my colleague Colin Smith that the government would work with SEPA to review this, and I very much hope that this is going to be done and would welcome an update. Uh, it is right that an ecosystem's approach to flooding is promoted in the land use strategy, which I believe should be given more weight. And flooding needs to be tackled, of course, with natural resources and ecosystems in mind. Man-made flood defences uh, are indeed, as the, Tory, um, uh, have, the Tories have made uh, clear, um, they have a part to play, but the Scottish Government must and is maximising our resilience through sustainable land and water management. Working in my own region of South Scotland, the Tweed Forum is a stellar example of, of uh, partnership working and sustainable flood prevention. With members of public bodies, local stakeholders, NGOs, the Forum has enhanced and protected the River Tweed and its tributaries in terms of natural built and cultural heritage, using... using catchment management 
and with its two strategic aims interlinked. There are indeed implications for the cooperation fund pillar two um, of CAP as we move forward beyond Brexit for this. Again, referring to our amendment, partnership working, uh, if it is really to work, must have the funding that it needs. And this year, SEPA has faced a budget cut uh, of £1.8 million, and I hope that this cut will not affect flooding priorities at all. Similarly, reliable funding is essential for the fire and rescue services, and this year again, cuts of £19.4 million uh, have taken place, and it is challenging to keep up to date with new equipment needed and uh, organised flood response working groups such as in Lanark in my region, which cannot function effectively if there is a risk of closure of local fire stations. Further, will the cut to local authorities affect uh, flooding? I don't want to be negative about these issues, but it is vitally important that there is adequate funding. Just yesterday, pupils from Earlston High School recounted to me in our Parliament chat room that in times of heavy rain, their school car park has been so flooded that cars were swept along. This takes me full circle to the necessity of research to inform regular reviews of the relevant strategies for all ranges of flood prevention and to protect our citizens here in Scotland now and in the future. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and members should note that we're really pushed for time um, so to take no more time than, than given. And I call Graham Day followed by John Scott. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Large-scale incidents over recent years have really, I think, brought home to people the severe impacts flooding can have on communities across the country. Not only the direct, the immediate, or indeed residual physical impacts of the flooding, but the subsequent effect on insurance premiums. My own constituency has managed to escape relatively lightly. We've tended largely to suffer only relatively small-scale localised events. But it's clear from elsewhere in Scotland, including Ellen and my colleague Julian Martin's constituency, that the extent to which the effects of climate change are being felt. Good progress is being made, of course, as we seek to reduce Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions. But the impacts of climate change are with us now, and they aren't going away. There are already significant steps being taken across the country to try to reduce the threat of flooding on homes and businesses. But whatever man-made or natural flood defences we deploy, we will never entirely put a stop to flooding. And we have many of our citizens living in or having businesses within areas that are prone to being impacted with all the trauma and upset that causes. And with that, of course, comes the added subsequent difficulty of securing affordable insurance. Uh, following the Cabinet Secretary's urgings, I therefore want to highlight the work of Flood Re, the first scheme of its kind in the world. Flood Re will be in place for a further 23 years and is designed to, amongst other things, enable flood cover to be affordable for those households at highest risk of flooding and increase the availability and choice of insurers for customers. Before the introduction of Flood Re, only 9% of households who had made prior flood claims could get quotes from two or more insurers. None were able to get quotes from five or more. In the scheme's first month in operation, first months rather in operation, this number rose dramatically to 68% of those households being able to get quotes from five or more insurers. By December 2016, that had increased further, so that 84% could get quotes from five or more, while 95% could get quotes from two or more. At launch, 16 insurance providers were signed up to the scheme, and this has now increased to 60, representing 90% of the home insurance market. That's extremely good news for everyone who lives in areas that are prone to such events, and we should acknowledge it as such. Lord Krebs of the UKCCC's Adaptation Subcommittee, when he was appearing before the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, made clear that homes restored under flood re should be done so in a more resilient way. So if they are flooded in the future, the properties will be insurable and the problems more manageable. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to working via the National Centre for Resilience with stakeholders, including the Association of British Insurers, the Building Standards Agency, the Scottish Flood Forum and Climate Exchange to encourage resilient home repairs after a flood and provide the most up-to-date information about techniques and materials to householders. Whilst we cannot, of course, control the weather, we can seek to mitigate its impact on our communities. There are various stakeholders responsible for minimising the risk of flood damage. The government, councils, householders and neighbours all have their roles to play. While some councils, such as Perth and Kinross and Dumfries and Galway, provide grants, 
for uh, uh, property level protection measures, such as barriers for doorways, uh, to those at high risk of flooding. That's not uniform. Another organisation I'd like to pay tribute to is the, Scot the aforementioned Scottish Flood Forum, which is a Scottish government funded charity which provides support for and represents those who are affected by or are at risk of flooding. Uh, I found the forum to be a great help when dealing with admittedly low level but nonetheless important to those concerned with constituency cases. The Scottish Flood Forum, rather like Flood Re, plays an important role. Let me conclude by focusing on the role that major engineered flood defences can have in improving the lives of those living or working in areas prone to very significant and traumatic flooding. Just over a year ago, as you'll recall, the Cabinet Secretary visited Brechin and my colleague Mary Goujon's constituency to open the town's new flood defence scheme. It provides a 1 in 200 years current day standard of defence and includes direct defences, flood embankments, flood walls, upgrades to the existing surface water drainage system, work on the Denmark, Denburn culvert and installation of three submerged pump stations. Even before it was completed, it had proved its worth during the construction process when it helped protect the town twice from potential flooding. The proposed Brothic Water Protection Scheme in my constituency was last year pri prioritised as one of 42 projects by SEPA for Scottish Government funding, and I look forward to seeing it progressing. Once completed, 530 people will no longer be at risk from flooding, and damage costing approximately £840,000 each year will be present, uh, prevented. Presiding officer, I, I welcome the steps that have been taken to mitigate uh, uh, flooding damage and help people move on from flooding. And I look forward to further effective measures being taken as our understanding of how best to meet flooding and its challenges improves. Presiding officer. John Scott, followed by Gillian Martin. Five minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I declare an interest in this debate as a farmer, although not one as yet affected by flooding? Can I also remark how much this feels like Groundhog Day for me and I suspect the Cabinet Secretary, both of us being survivors of the Flood Risk Management Scotland Bill 2009. And can I put on record that eight years on, I think that bill has served its purpose well. And many of the matters under this consideration then are matters still under discussion and now require to be taken on to the next stage. So, presiding officer, without hesitation, we welcome the government's intention to increase the budget allocated for natural assets and flooding. We welcome the 22.3% increase in the river basin management budget and note that the coasts and flood budget level three has been maintained at £1.2 million. However, we regret that SEPA's budget has been cut from 37 to 35.9 million, and notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary's remarks, we still think this intended budget reduction requires further explanation. And we note, Presiding Officer, the maintenance of the coast and flood budget, but we think this is an area where in future we may have to shoulder significant increases to prevent coastal ero erosion and inundation. In the evidence taken in the 2009 bill, the evidence available then from the Met Office predicted a sea level rise by 2080 of up to 75 centimetres. But I think this estimate is now being viewed as a conservative one, given the prediction of last week of an 8 to 10 feet sea level rise by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as reported by Business Insider. And while land and river flooding has the potential to inflict massive damage on cities like Perth, these threats pale into insignificance when compared to the threat of sea level rise for our children and grandchildren living in coastal towns and cities. Regrettably, at some point, we in Scotland may have to decide which areas we allow to be reclaimed by the sea and which areas we endeavour to protect. And I would suggest that this is a strategic thinking that should now be taking place by government, by SEPA, by the Royal Society, by RICS, by Carlisle, and indeed us all. A national debate on this threat won't solve the problem, but it will at least focus minds. Turning now to land-based flooding and river basin management, again, this is an area where there's a finite limit to hard flood mitigation measures. There is only so much concrete we can use and afford, and so we need to look again at the use of natural capital. Again, this was a point made at recommendation 13 in the stage two, one report in the 2009 Flood Risk Management Bill. And I would again reiterate that we now have to do more and use more imaginatively upstream flood plains and landscapes to take the peaks of floods that have inflicted so much damage in the past. 
Sophisticated hydrology to achieve this remains at least part of the solution to this growing need. And land managers should continue to be encouraged to help with this as an identifiable public good in a post-Brexit Scotland and, the, and in also on that subject and the illegal release of beavers into the tea catchment area only makes a difficult situation much worse. Managed landscapes, managed hydrology will perhaps provide long-term protection for the citizens in the tea catchment area. However, uncontrolled beaver reintroduction will only reduce hydrologists and land managers' abilities to use natural capital and landscape assets to provide necessary flood protection. However, no debate on flooding could pass without me mentioning internal and external flooding issues already have referred to by the Cabinet Secretary in Presswick, and I am grateful to her for meeting me on this subject yesterday afternoon, as well as senior Scottish water officials meeting with me on the 8th of November. I welcome their acknowledgement of this problem and the now established need to work collaboratively with South Ayrshire Council and indeed other partners to create an integrated drainage and surface water management plan in the longer term for my constituents in response to the rainfall driven sewer flooding problems which Scottish Water are trying to address immediately as well. Of course this will require some millions of pounds of funding and this is where the Scottish Government can help. And I again ask the Cabinet Secretary to see what she can do in this regard to help my constituents. So, Presiding Officer, the 2009 Act has made a start to addressing flooding issues in Scotland. It will be, need to be built on and enhanced to deal with future problems. Thank you. Gillian Martin, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2016, my constituency was ravaged by flooding, but it was a culmination of heavy rains over the Christmas and New Year period. We had avoided the terrible flooding that took place over on the west side of Aberdeenshire, um, Mr Burnett's constituency at New Year. But early in the morning of the 8th of January, the people from Port Elphinstone, Keith Hall and Veruri, 95 homes in total, Ellen, 65 homes in total, and many families in Methlick were rescued from, them, from their homes, some in boats, and evacuated to local schools who opened their doors for them. Many more towns and village, villages also suffered flood damage. But it's the long-term aftermath of a flood that I want to talk about. Uh, the, the road to getting back into your home is long and difficult, and the effects of a flood last a lot longer than the time it takes to refurnish a house, um, for which some people in my constituency it took up to a year. But people live long-term with the anxiety of flooding ever happening again, and that's why this debate is so important. People want to know we have a strategy to prevent flooding. And I'm sure that the words of the Cabinet Secretary outlining the substantial flood strategy are welcomed. Port Elphinstone, Inveruri and Ellen hit very badly are of course included in the ongoing flood protection studies around the Don, Uri and Ithan rivers. And the results of these studies will inform whether flood protection schemes for the areas I've mentioned are the way forward as they have been for Elgin and Stonehaven who escaped the ravages of Storm Desmond in 2016. But one of the things I discovered in the months after the floods is that ongoing communication with residents is absolutely vital but it's also missing. Just as vital as partnership working between agencies like our government, local authorities, SEPA, river management groups, landowners, farmers and Scottish Water. But in Port Elphinstone, we had a situation where the River Don burst through a protective bund, drains couldn't cope and a privately owned canal called the Laid overflowed and that all converged to drive people out of their homes. So SEPA have a role in the river, the local authority have responsibility for flood protection bunds and Scottish Water are responsible for the drains and then there's an added uh, stretch of water that's owned by a private company. In the months and years after the event, I've spent a considerable amount of time trying to get everyone responsible for all the pieces of the Port Elveston flooding jigsaw in that area in the same room to talk to residents. And one of the difficulties has been the residents not been informed when the repair or flood management work has been carried out. And neither me nor my staff, office staff will forget the day that Port Elphinstone uh, residents woke up to find a channel of the canal filled in with soil. And this was an attempt by private owners to manage the canal. They said they'd taken advice from SEPA, we know they had, but they neglected to form the residents living next to that canal. When flood management decisions are taken, everyone must work together. But they can't forget that those residents 
are suffering a trauma and they need to be kept in the loop. I think that's vitally important. On another note, I just want to end by talking a little bit flood prevention and to recognise the work of Peatland Action. The situation in Ellen, Methlick and Inverurie and other areas in my constituency was caused by heavy rainfall, saturating fields that couldn't soak up any more and rivers bursting their banks and a temperature drop that meant further upstream where there was once ice and snow, there was water. We have a natural resource that is vital in soaking up excess water and that's our peatlands. In Scotland, we have 4% of the world's peatlands. Not only do they hold 140 years worth of carbon emissions, which we know are leading to global temperature rises and contributing to flood events, the sphag and moss in peatlands can hold up 25 times the amount of water as a kitchen sponge. The terrain in our mountains and hills are source keys to flood prevention. Sphagnum mosses and heather, when allowed to regenerate, hold water in the hills for longer and reduce peak flows downstream during high rainfall events. So it's not just about how we deal with flood events when they happen, but the environmental work we do now to lessen the amount of water making its way downstream to cause a, fl a flooding event. Restoration of our nation's peatlands are a good start. And we cannot ignore the long-term strategy the Climate Change Plan, which in itself is testament to how seriously the Scottish Government is in dealing with the environmental causes of flooding. Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you. And I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Up to six minutes, please, Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. It is just two years, as we have heard, since heavy rainfall and winter storms brought disastrous flooding to parts of Aberdeen and the North East. As we go into another winter, the question many people will ask is whether there has been real and fundamental change that can give them confidence that such a disaster will not happen again. Two years ago, following Storm Frank, hundreds of properties were flooded, serious damage was caused, and many people suffered both trauma and material loss as a result. Uh, a lot of the coverage, rightly, was of the uh, uh, effects on the upper reaches of the River Dee and the River Don, uh, Ballater, uh, for example, uh, in Maruri and Kemney, as well, but also there, was, uh, impact, there were impacts on the city of Aberdeen at the other end of the River Dee where sheltered housing had to be evacuated uh, at the Bridge of Dee and where there were uh, also floods elsewhere in the city. There was rightly a lot of focus on the efforts of local communities to help themselves and on fantastic charitable efforts like Hope Floats involving some of the same people involved with Aberdeen Solidarity with Refugees, making the point that community engagement uh, works at home and abroad. Today's debate highlights the role of public agencies like SEPA, local authorities, Scottish Water and the Scottish Government, but public agencies cannot deliver flood recovery or flood resilience unless they take communities and local people with them. Flooding in North East Scotland is nothing new, nor is it confined to major rivers like the Dee and the Don. As Gillian Martin mentioned, Stonehaven uh, was fortunate two years ago, but it has perhaps had the most frequent damage from rain, rain and floods over the years, with flooding from the Carron water and the Cowie water, landslips on the Berry Braes, and coastal flooding also from North Sea storms. The flood protection scheme which Aberdeenshire Council is taking forward at Stonehaven is intended to provide protection for nearly 400 homes against a once in 200 years flooding event. It will cost 16 million pounds and is due to be completed in 2020. That is a very welcome initiative, of course, but the reality is that more and more homes and businesses are at risk from flooding and local councils need resources as well as a, part, as a partnership approach to meet the needs of the communities in question. The reason for that increasing risk is, of course, as has been highlighted already today, climate change. The former chief scientist to the Met Office, Dame Julia Slingo, has summed up the science, of course, yep. Liam Kerr. I thank Lewis MacDonald for taking the intervention. Just on the point about local authorities, given that uh, I think Aberdeen's the lowest funded council in Scotland, the Shire, the third fundest, and uh, Angus Council are facing a shortfall of 50 million due to Scottish Government cuts, can they really be expected to uh, cover all of the flood risk? Lewis MacDonald. Well, if the point he's making is that local authorities in the North East and local authorities across Scotland need more support from the Scottish Government, of course that's uh, a point I would echo. But, but if there's any suggestion that flood prevention or flood risk are not recognised as high priorities for local authorities, then clearly I would take a different view. But I think the, 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 the main point he's making is one I, I would support. Jim Julia Slingo told uh, 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 the Royal Society of Edinburgh recently, an extended period of extreme UK winter rainfall is now seven times more likely 
than in a world without human emissions of greenhouse gases. Seven times more likely because of climate change, and it will only get worse over the next few decades, even if the rate of production of greenhouse gases can be significantly reduced. In other words, planning for low carbon emissions while dealing with the flood risks we know about now will not be enough. We need also to mitigate the increased risks of more frequent and severe floods for the foreseeable future. And that means providing the resources to communities and public agencies to allow them to play their part. I was fortunate enough to be an environment minister some 12 years ago when the then Scottish executive was able to take a major step forward in flood hazard mapping technology. Three-dimensional mapping of the whole of Scotland underpinned the development of higher resolution river and coastal flood hazard maps that had, than had previously been available. And since then, the data and modelling methodologies have been improved further, as the Cabinet Secretary said, to allow, for example, surface water risk maps to be published uh, three or four years ago. It was good to be involved at a key stage in the development of what is now a sophisticated flood risk management system, but clearly more still needs to be done. High quality digital terrain models are now available, which can help bring risk assessment of coastal and surface water risks up to the levels already achieved for rivers. New technologies can also help assess the state of sewers, also mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, and of culverted burn, burns in urban areas, uh, very important uh, for me as a resident of Aberdeen, but also in other towns and cities too. There are currently over 100,000 properties at risk of flooding across Scotland. SEPA estimate that this number will rise by an additional 60,000 homes by 2080 due to the impact of climate change. That is a lot of extra risk and a lot of public expenditure will indeed be required. But whatever, because we know whatever flood prevention schemes and early warning schemes are put in place, flooding will happen. That is why we need also to improve household and community resilience. Despite the, res the vulnerability of so many properties to flooding, the number of people without flood insurance is higher in Scotland than it is in England. Over 22% of households are nearly uh, two in every nine. Not only that, but that lack of insurance is unequal. Over half of lowest income households are not insured for, for flooding. Tenants often have no contents insurance in rented properties, while some private landlords see no need to pay for buildings insurance for those buildings. Of course, providers, and the, uh, Rosanna Cunningham mentioned it, the insurance providers have developed schemes to reduce premiums in high risk areas, but that has not helped those who are not insured. So there's an urgent need, I think, for government to look at this issue, and I hope we'll hear a little from the Minister this afternoon on what more can be done to ensure that poorer households uh, have the cover they need. That has got to be part of planning for future uh, flood risk management, along with the other things that have been mentioned. Thank you. Mark Ruskell, to be followed by Mike Rumbles, up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I welcome this opportunity to debate flooding here this afternoon? It's certainly far better to debate this now rather than the political maelstrom of a flooding crisis. And I think there's been a, perhaps a few in this chamber um, over the years. Now, we've already heard the uh, SEPA estimate that there are 108,000 properties in Scotland that are presently at risk. And we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary that we've got 40 flood protection projects being funded by the Scottish Government. Welcome investment, utilising a £42 million capital budget. But of course, that will only support and protect 10,000 properties by 2026. So over 90% of properties at risk will receive no protection. And by the time we get to 2026, the number of houses at risk will be dramatically revised upwards. And we've already heard the figure from Lewis MacDonald, the SEPA's estimate, that we could be looking at yet another 60,000 properties at risk by 2080. And I'm starting to see the impact of a, of a lack of available capital funds on the ground. In Stirling Council, multiple competing projects for flood protection work came forward for Scottish Government funding. So, <clears throat> some, such as Bridge of Allen, have been successful in squeezing through the funding formula, and communities are very grateful for that. Um, but for many smaller rural settlements, the low number of residential properties weighs up against projects. And in the case of Aberfoyle, being repeatedly flooded out year after year, it was starting to rip the economic heart out of the town, devastate public services such as the school. But the low number of residential properties kicked the possibility of Scottish Government funding out of reach. Now, I am concerned that while we cannot protect everything everywhere, a constrained funding model is leaving some communities behind. 
or it's placing an impossible strain on councils who are having to choose between maintaining roads on one side or building flood walls on the other. I'm not under any illusion that hard engineering measures alone will provide a total solution. And sensible planning decisions, such as not building on floodplains like Bridge of Allen's Air 3 Curse, need to be made by planning authorities and then backed up by the planning minister. But we also need to take natural flood management more seriously. And there were concerns when the original 2009 Act went through that natural flood management would not be embedded enough in the solutions and the projects that would come from that new holistic approach. And I'll go back to the example of Aberfoyle again. Stirling Council recently led a big piece of work to look at how such an approach could be used to significantly reduce the extent and therefore the cost of hard defence measures in the town. The stumbling block was that landowners didn't want to buy into an approach which ultimately would have saved taxpayers money and helped save the town. Now with the land use strategy quietly introduced, there is a need for government to ensure that if land does not deliver public goods such as flood prevention, then it simply doesn't get public subsidy. And I know also that the closure of the Environmental Cooperation Action Fund means that there's little support for farmers to cooperate now on a catchment scale. In a, in a second. The new Rural Innovation Support Service could fill that gap over time, but only has funding for research and development at present. Yes, I'll give way to Mr. Mountain. Edward Mountain. Mr. Russell, thank you very much for giving way. My, my question really is, is, is that for land to deliver public good, I agree, that's the, that's the time that it should get, should get any subsidies from the government, but it's making sure that the subsidies meet the loss in the case of floodplains. Uh, that's the difficulty. Can you see a way around that? Mark Ruskell. Well, I think it comes back to the definition of what are public goods, and I think we need to have a debate in this Parliament about how we value natural capital. I'd certainly like to see farmers rewarded for the public goods that they're delivering. I think natural capital is a way to achieve that. But we need to have this debate in this chamber about what is the purpose of agricultural subsidies post-Brexit. Um, we don't have that full debate. I very much like the Cabinet Secretary um, Fergus Ewing to come to this chamber and, and debate that with you and, and me. Um, when land managers get it right, as in the case of the Eddleston water, which we've already heard an example, they can protect communities. But when land managers get it wrong, the public sector often picks up the bill. The dramatic floods, for example, in Dunblane Bridge of Allen in 2012 was caused in part by a farmer plowing fields in the wrong direction. Simple to do, but a catastrophic result. We've also seen zero successful applications for agroforestry grants in Scotland, with the budget now being cut as a result. And, you know, why is this? Where is the driver for natural flood management that should be resulting in dozens of applications for riparian planting schemes? Um, so, presiding officer, in closing, I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will have three conversations with Cabinet colleagues on the back of this debate. One with Derek Mackay about the long-term sustainability of an infrastructure fund that only protects 10% of homes from flooding. Another with Kevin Stewart about the need for consistent planning decisions which don't make this expensive crisis even more costly. And thirdly, a conversation with Fergus Ewing to make sure that the land use strategy is being realized on the ground because right now expectations on land managers are low and the delivery is dismal in many areas. Thank you. Mike Rumbles, followed by Angus MacDonald. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Rumbles. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Once again, we have before us a rather <clears throat> aren't we doing well sort of motion, which we are all supposed to support. And why shouldn't we support a motion which says that the risk-based, plan-led, multi-agency partnership approach to tackle flooding is the way forward? Well, of course it is. And, and uh, therefore, the Liberal Democrats will, of course, be supporting the motion in tonight's vote, as we will be supporting the Conservative Amendment and the Labour Amendment. Everything seems so sensible this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr Crawford. <laughs> However, just wait. Um, as opposition MSPs, we would not be doing our job if we didn't hold the government to account for their actions, or rather lack of them as well. And that is, of course, exactly what I aim to do in my contribution to this debate. Now, communities in the northeast have suffered from severe flooding several times over recent years. Major flooding events have occurred in Ballata, Aboyne, Dunhaven, Kemney, Inverurie, and Huntley, to name just a few towns and villages across the northeast. 
Now, I'm going to concentrate on the issue of government funding for flood defences, and I wouldn't want the Minister to think it's just me criticising the government's actions on this issue. Lack of time presents me from referring to more than just one report in the Scotsman newspaper of the 16th of January last year. It reported that, and I quote, John Swinney said the Scottish government had provided flood defences to communities length and breadth of Scotland as he defended budget cuts to the country's environment agency. Mr Swinney faced stinging criticism yesterday for reducing funding for the Scottish Environment Protection Agency by 6% from £39 million to £36 million in the 2016-17 budget. Now, 10 years ago, in 2007, when the current SNP government came to power, and hopefully it won't be there for much longer, it transferred responsibility for flood defences from itself to our local authorities. However, the Cabinet Secretary said earlier in the opening debate, very proudly, that the Scottish Government has provided funding of £42 million a year through lo the local government settlement for local authorities. But nine years ago, back in 2008, guess what? It was also £42 million a year. Now, to be fair to the Scottish government, and I always liked to be that, it does provide other funds to tackle flood protection and relief other than through the local government allocation. Let's just take one of these the Scottish Government's Natural Assets and Funding Budget Line. According to information I received yesterday from the Parliament's Information Centre, the budget line for flood alleviation and coast protection was 1.2 million in 2013-14, 1.2 million in 2014-15, 1.2 million in 2015-16, and you can guess what the 16-17 figure is, and I'm sure you can guess what the 17-18 figure is, it's 1.2 million. Now, this is not good news for communities like Montrose, for instance, where the town faces a real flooding threat from coastal erosion. Well, of course, yes. Liam Kerr. I thank Mr. Rumbles for taking the intervention. You mentioned Montrose and coastal erosion in the same breath. Flooding looks inevitable, as I put to the Cabinet Secretary earlier on, unless something is done and done fast. Does the member agree with me that the Scottish Government must proactively step in and do something about it now? Mike Rumbles. Yes, I'm, I'm glad to take that intervention. I agree 100% what Liam Kerr has just said. Now, I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the situation facing Montrose. You mentioned it in, in response to Liam Kerr's earlier intervention, because she visited it herself to see what the situation was earlier this year. Now, MSPs from across the political divide, such as Liam Kerr and myself, have raised this issue directly with the Cabinet Secretary to see if funding can be raised to tackle this issue before any flooding occurs in Montrose as a result of this coastal erosion. I pay tribute to, to Liam, to Liam Kerr, uh, who has been very willing to work together to see, to tackle for the people of Montrose this issue and trying to put party politics aside and get a result. Much better to act now before anything happens uh, than wait for the risk of flooding becoming too great. I am convinced that, you know, Montrose is under threat. And it's a real threat. And we do need some action. We've both approached Angus Council. They don't have the funding to tackle it. Uh, I heard the minister say earlier on that we're going to wait uh, until we see what uh, can be done. Perhaps the Secretary uh, could, Cabinet Secretary could give us an update on the situation in Montrose as she sees it right now in her summing up, because I'm sure members across the chamber would appreciate that. Now, turning to the government's motion before us today, I see the time is running out. Who could possibly disagree with it? Who could disagree with it? We certainly don't. No, no, I don't disagree with it at all, Bruce Crawford, from a sedentary position there. And therefore, we will be supporting it decision time, as I said. However, do not mistake this for uncritical support. I'm sure you couldn't mistake it for uncritical support. Holding the government to account for their actions is exactly what we are supposed to be doing in these debates. That is so much more important than engaging in self-congratulation, which this government is far too keen to do. Uh, speeches of five minutes from now on, please. Uh, Angus MacDonald, followed by Oliver Mundell. Okay, thanks, uh, President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to contribute to today's debate, given the constituency interest that I have, not least the threat of flooding uh, to industry in Grangemouth. 
a flood risk management, something which uh, particularly over the last few years has been an important part of planning in Scotland. The, the more years go by, the more extreme weather we become subjected to and the greater the risk to our communities and businesses from flooding. Clearly these changes in weather patterns are some of the effects of climate change in action and I'd like to pay tribute uh, in contrast to uh, Mr Rumbles uh, to the Scottish Government for doing what it can to tackle climate change and put in place a legacy of protection for the future. Uh, however, with sea levels continuing to rise and no doubt further challenges uh, to face us in the years to come, it's important to recognise the work being done now to protect our communities and businesses from the potentially devastating effects of flooding. So today's debate is an opportunity for me to highlight the excellent collaborative work being undertaken in my own constituency of Falkirk East, which will benefit communities across Falkirk District, not to mention the industries in Grangemouth, which are vital to Scotland's economy and our GDP. Now, the, the recognition of the importance of protecting our communities is not a recent occurrence. Under the previous SNP administration in Falkirk Council, which I was part of, a consideration was given to the effects of flooding, uh, to the effects flooding could have on our communities. And it was at this point where our administration started to invest in flood defences and protection for communities. The initial plans were put in place for the, flood, uh, the Bowness Flood Alleviation Scheme, which was confirmed in 2006 and built by 2013, which was the first step in beginning to plan for future events of extreme weather. And members in the chamber will be under no illusion as to the importance of Grangemouth and its industry to Scotland. So uh, it's only right that we put plans in place to protect it from the risks flooding poses in the future. One such project which is already underway is the Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme, uh, which as part of NPF 3 in 2014, it was highlighted that the Grangemouth Investment Zone required the construction of flood defence structures and or the undertaking of works for flood defence where the area of development is, is or exceeds two hectares. So while in the National Flood Risk Management Strategy published by SEPA in 2015, the Grange, Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme was ranked first out of 42 identified schemes across Scotland and is recognised as being vitally important. It's recognised that the scheme, when in place, will protect 5,000 properties, residential, commercial and industrial, it was estimated flood damages avoided in the region of £6 billion, so it's clearly money well spent. Now, Grangemouth is surrounded by a number of water courses, including the Forth Estuary, the rivers Carron and Avon, as well as the Grange Burn, so members will realise how important it is for this scheme to be in place. Uh, studies have been undertaken on this project since 2015 and most recently ground investigation works along the tidal reaches of the River Carron and the River Avon have been completed and reported on. And Falkirk Council are now at the stage where options are being appraised and considered for the next stage of the scheme and core stakeholders, with, uh, and core stakeholders within a uh, Falkirk Council, uh, the utilities, industrial partners such as INEOS and elected members have been consulted with the next phase of public engagement scheduled for 20. 18. So to date, and with thanks to the Scottish Government, Falkirk Council have spent £2 million in getting Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme to this stage, such as the complex nature of the scheme, and the latest estimates put the cost at £139 million to complete the scheme. However, there will be um, investment from industry in, in, in that. Um, given that it will be protecting against damages of up to £6 billion, as I've already mentioned, it's clear to see the importance of this scheme to Grangemouth and to Scotland uh, as a whole, uh, not to mention the communities in Grangemouth as well. So uh, in addition, further work is planned to be carried out along the Fourth Estuary shoreline near to the village of Earth. Uh, it's currently at the study phase, which uh, will now be taken forward for consideration in the next cycle of flood risk management plans. However, this doesn't necessarily mean it will be progressed as a formal flood protection scheme. Um, so it's encouraging to see Falkirk uh, or, uh, Council um, partnership working with SEPA and Scottish Water to deliver functional surface water management plans. And in addition, um, the work carried out by SEPA, Scottish Water and other agencies towards protecting communities is clearly of vital importance. So in conclusion, presiding officer, my own local authority, Falkirk Council, alongside their partners, are to be commended for the work they're undertaking to ensure our communities, industry and vital national assets are as protected as they can be from the potential risk of flooding. However, it's also incumbent upon us, 
all of us to ensure that communities and individuals have access to the necessary insurance, advice and information to further protect themselves should defences fail in the face of an ever-changing climate. Thank you. Oliver Mundell, followed by Bruce Crawford. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm grateful to have uh, the opportunity to speak in this important debate and to put across some of the concerns uh, of my constituents uh, and myself and to put those on the record. Well, I recognise there is a great deal of positive work and engagement taking place around Scotland uh, on flooding issues. My experience in Dumfrieshire is that warm words and interagency working often fall short of action. The design and implementation of solutions often moves at an infuriatingly slow pace and has left many with the ever constant fear of seeing their home destroyed. The scale of the challenge ahead and the dire problems our communities face can be seen from the sheer number of towns and villages across the Dumfrieshire constituency who continue to battle against rising flood waters. These include Langham, Estale Muir, East Riggs, Eaglesfield, Monny Ive, Thornhill, Annan, Moffat, Wanlock Head and Dumfries amongst others and my mailbag is perpetually full of concerns. Many of those who get in touch feel abandoned and find that their views are disregarded and, are, and that all too often the process is dictated by the views of the local authority. If we are talking of genuine partnerships, we need to see the views of local residents taken more seriously. And rather than passing the buck, Dumfries and Galloway Council must start taking their core responsibilities for road drainage in particular more seriously. I wish to highlight the ill feelings and serious concerns that exist locally over the White Sands uh, flooding scheme. It will be no secret for members to know uh, that I've consistently called for the £25 million scheme proposed for the River Nith in Dumfries town to be axed. Like many people living locally, I believe that the council's it's the council's incompetence that will ultimately destroy our town centre, not the overspilling of water from the River Nith. Rather than a genuine consultation with local people and business owners, the Labour Party, particularly in the previous administration, have pushed their own pet project forward and have tagged an unpopular landscape gardening scheme onto proposals to build a defensive bund. Even the Scottish Government must be confused as to why local people don't want £25 million spent in their area. But flood defences are important. However, it's clear that the problem in this case is that people don't want this particular scheme and never will. To be fair, there is little, this is no wonder that local residents are sceptical about the Council's ability to build a bund uh, designed to keep water out when the, that same council have spent years floundering in their efforts to build a swimming pool capable of keeping water in it. And I'm afraid I'm not going to take any interventions because I'm very tight uh, on time. Uh, naturally, I do welcome as an objector an inquiry into this scheme, but I do have continued concerns that it will take up to two years to complete and we still don't know how much that inquiry will cost taxpayers. We cannot be certain of the outcome of that inquiry but it is alarming that over 400 local residents and businesses have sent in legal objections to the proposal, despite very legitimate concerns. It seems that the council, and despite these very legitimate concerns, it seems that the council are absolutely hell bent on proceeding with this scheme by hook or by crook. Meanwhile, residents in Nunholm and Kingham uh, live in continued fear that if the scheme goes ahead, it will narrow the water uh, channel and lead to water being displaced into their properties. I continue to back local residents uh, throughout the process and I hope at the very least uh, this will allow their concerns to be aired, tested and taken seriously by the council. Returning to my earlier comments about road drainage, I feel it's important to remember that flooding is not just caused by our natural rivers. In some cases, I have constituents living in damp and miserable uh, conditions because of significant drainage issues on local roads. This to me seems to be an easy fix and members can only imagine the frustration of local residents living in Annan and East Riggs who earlier this year experienced a great deal of damage following flash floods. Their anger was compounded when they found out that despite flooding issues being well known in the area that the street drains hadn't even been checked let alone cleared 
in eight months. It's only a question, but it seems a relatively obvious one to me. Instead of prioritising a grand multi-million pound flood defence scheme in Dumfries that very few people support, maybe the council needs to prioritise smaller schemes elsewhere across my constituency. Thank you. Bruce Crawford, followed by Alexander Burnett. President Officer, thank you. The President Officer will know all evidence suggests that the weather events that create flooding are only likely to increase as a result of human-made global warming. I wish I had more time to address that, but speaking time reductions prohibit. Can I at least pay tribute to our country's significant achievements in reducing our carbon footprint over recent years? President Officer, a number of areas across my own constituency are severely affected by repeated flooding events. The City of Stirling's relationship with the River Forth presents many challenges. More than 730 residential and 80 non-residential properties are judged at being at risk from flooding. Around 80% of these are directly at risk due to the swelling of the River Forth during and under adverse weather conditions. In rural Stirling and Callander, flooding can often disrupt traffic, businesses and homes. And again, it's its relationship with the river, on this occasion the River Teeth, that causes the majority of disruption and damage. But let me at this stage recognise the efforts of Stirling Council in investing in mitigation measures for areas such as Callander, Bridgehawk and Riverside. I've no doubt they could do more and people would want them to do so, but the measures they've taken at least have been helpful. So too is the Scottish Government's financial help for flooded properties. Now that's gone some way to alleviating concerns, particularly for businesses who can often lose out on vital trade as a result of flooding. However, President Officer, today I want to share in some detail with members the challenging situation in the town of Aberfoyle in my constituency. And I should say, I also share some of the concerns raised by Mark Ruskell in regard to Aberfoyle. Again, situated on the River Forth, uh, Aberfoyle is exposed to increased flood risk as a result of sustained heavy rain or snow melt. The effect this has on the community, and not just on the day-to-day -day life, but on the running of the shops and businesses there, but on the overall impact on the village's morale is becoming more pronounced. The situation is also pro uh, pro creating a prohib prohibition on investment in Aberfoyle, and it's created a drag on the local economy. <coughs> For instance, I was saddened recently to see the closure of the Ghana Garden Centre. That business occupies a, or occupied a key, a key footprint in the village centre. President Officer, in recent years, Stirling Council has looked at support mechanisms from the Scottish Government in order to address the risk of flooding in Aberfoyle. A plan based on a one in 200 year event was understandably rejected by the local community, largely due to the significant visual impact of such hard, large defences. Further to that, a one in ten year plan that would not that would provided the village with that would not have provided the village with an adequate level of flood defence was also rejected. Sadly, however, as a result of a lack of an acceptable firm plan, Stirling Council missed the funding window for Scottish Government support towards flood defences. You know, but whatever that background might be, wherever the difficulties might have been, I think we've all got to try to work together to find the best possible outcome for the community. For if they don't, I fear further deterioration of the economic offering of the area. Tackling the problem of flooding in Aberfoyle, or at least some positive forward movement will help attract new investment into the town. It will make it easier for businesses to secure insurance cover and reignite a sense of purpose for many local people. On the ground, moves are being made to look at methods of tackling the flooding rightly further upstream by the local flood forum. And I applaud the work that they do, but they're only just always touch the surface. The, waters, the council is continuing to assess how it can best mitigate the impact of flooding our, our foil, with what looks at on the face of it now, a plan for a one, on the face of it, at least acceptable, a plan for a one in 100 year flood scheme. Um, being promoted. However, the next round of funding for Scottish Government support in this area is not until 2022, and you might imagine this seems a very long time away in the future for many in the village. However, it is important that a lasting solution is, is met. 
Therefore, can I ask the ministers to open up discussions with Stirling Council officials about how best the Scottish Government can support an application process for flood defence investment in Aberfoyle? In, in closing, can I say I have been deeply impressed by the resilience of the community in the face of real challenge. Aberfoyle always has been a remarkable place to visit and to set up home. It will continue to be so, no matter what is thrown at it. But if the threat of flooding can be alleviated, it can continue to establish itself as a must-visit destination, offering an incredible backdrop of scenic beauty that the people of Scotland can continue to access and enjoy for many generations to come. President Officer. Alexander Burnett to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm glad to be able to speak in this debate today. Uh, for flooding is a problem that affects families, infrastructure and businesses across Scotland especially in the North East and especially in my constituency, Aberdeenshire West. I know firsthand how devastating flood damage can be, and I note my register of interest as I also had property damaged by Storm Frank. Storm Frank floods cause more damage in Ballata than any other community in the UK, with 300 homes and 60 businesses were flooded. Rebuilding efforts went on for months, and businesses are still rebuilding two years later and the extent of flood risk simply cannot be overstated. The Scottish Government estimates that over 100,000 properties across Scotland are at risk for flooding, and one in 13 Scottish businesses remain at risk. And as flooding continues to threaten our communities, the current funding framework for flood prevention remains inadequate. Annual flooding damages total an estimated £252 million in Scotland, and 1.1 billion across the United Kingdom. Yet despite this staggering figure, funding from the Scottish Government has stagnated and will remain so for the next 10 years. The Scottish Government has also announced further cuts in the coming year to SEPA. And as a result, only 42 flood protection projects across Scotland will receive priority funding until 2021. So as the gap grows between funds allocated and funds needed for flood relief and prevention, the Scottish Government must change its approach. However, the review of potentially vulnerable areas, or PVAs, happens every six years, which will now not be until 2019, though it can be earlier with the Cabinet Secretary's discretion. And this becomes especially problematic when an area has not been designated as a PVA is flooded. Kemney, a village in my constituency, was devastated by Storm Frank. But Kemney was not identified as an area of significant flood risk in 2011. And although updated flood maps in December 2013 and the flooding of the River Don in January 2016 would have labelled Kemney a PVA back in 2011. Now the Kemhill Park Flooding Group and many others have worked tirelessly to get Kemney added to the list of priorities in areas in Aberdeenshire for the current funding cycle. Unfortunately, a permanent flood defence system cannot be constructed until Aberdeenshire Council commissions an extensive flood risk assessment from SEPA. But Aberdeenshire Council says this will not happen until Kemney is designated a PVA. And whether this is correct or not, perhaps this could be clarified by the Cabinet Secretary. But regardless of a response, the fact remains that the Council simply do not have the funds. Now, without a Scotland-wide review of PVAs, flooded areas that were not listed at the beginning of the cycle are being neglected. And on three separate occasions at committee, I've raised flooding with the Cabinet Secretary, including to review PVAs before the end of the six-year cycle. And on each of these occasions, she has confirmed that the Scottish Ministers have no plans to amend the timetable. In October 2016, the Cabinet Secretary said the decision not to include Kemney as a PVA was taken by SEPA based on the best evidence available at the time, including flood maps, historical flood data, held for the area, and public consultation. Her comments next month with regulations require SEPA must review and update where appropriate and submit to the Scottish Ministers the document identifying the PVAs by 22nd of September 2018. And there are no plans to change this date. In May this year, I got the same insufficient response. While Scottish Ministers have a power under the Flood Risk Management Act to direct SEPA to review and where appropriate update the document which identifies PVAs at other times, out with this six-year cycle, there are no plans to use this power. Why not? 
as the Scottish Government reallocates money away from flood prevention, at-risk communities will continue to suffer. Current funding is barely able to support PVA schemes alone, and the Scottish Government must undertake a review. It must provide more support for flood, flood prevention so that flooding does not continue to wreak havoc on our communities and residents are not in fear again this winter. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, President Officer. Splendid isolation. No, not the Tory Brexit Britain uh, that we're going to have in the near, very near future, but actually Inverclyde's attitude to dealing with flood prevention and the flooding issues that we've had. Now, just for Mr Rumble's um, information, uh, the Lib Dems actually were in power between 2003 and 2007 in Inverclyde, and they did nothing to try to resolve some of the flooding issues that we actually had. And prior to them, we had Labour for 20 years doing nothing. Oh, and also we also had eight years of a Labour Liberal Democrat executive who did nothing to try to fix some of the problems we actually have in Inverclyde and have had for many, many years. It's not a new issue in Inverclyde. It goes back decades, even before the Second World War, but it's been, there's been little focus to try to fix and deal with any of the issues. And certainly as a boy growing up in Port Glasgow, I remember the pinch points in Inverclyde, and some of them still exist today. And since I was first elected in 2007, I've therefore raised the issue of flooding in Inverclyde as an issue that needs to be addressed. And after my first article about flooding on the A8 uh, and the, in the Weir Street area of the East End of Greenock, I was contacted by a constituent who offered some information to assist. And at the end of our meeting, he wished me good luck, but also uh, ended with uh, the phrase of, you've bitten off more than you, can, than you can chew on this issue. I took that as a challenge. Now, I was contacted by a second constituent who also wanted to raise flooding issues in a different part of Greenock. And by raising the issue further, and also by getting some further reports uh, in the local media, uh, the Cabinet Secretary may remember of her visit down to Greenock, and, uh, uh, which I hosted at uh, the home of uh, Greenock Morton at Capelow Park. And I also organised uh, the Flooding Summit uh, with uh, her successor, Stuart Stevenson, MSP, and, uh, and with many local partners. Now, that certainly was a very useful event, and it would have been even better if the Inverclay Council had actually sent somebody to actually participate in that particular summit. Now, it didn't surprise me, however, as there had been a, an attitude of flooding isn't a problem here in, in Rochelle Council. And that was put to me by a business uh, who actually were trying to assist locally. But that's what they were told by an official of the council. Would the member take a brief intervention? Sure. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, does the member agree with me that he perfectly illustrates the need for ministers and others who have any responsibility to visit communities affected? And that's something this government has been particularly assiduous in doing. Stuart McMillan. I absolutely agree 100% uh, with uh, Mr. Stevenson. Well, I mean, well, I mean, some Tories are laughing, but actually ministers going out and cabinet secretaries going out to visit uh, communities is really important. Now, if the Tories don't agree with that, then that's their fault. The presiding officer, as you and also members will know, Inverclyde, I've already taken one, I've taken one and I don't, I've only got five minutes, I'm sorry. The presiding officer, as you and members will know, that Inverclyde has the River Clyde on one side, uh, and the, at the top of the hill, we've got Loch Tom, the Greif Reservoir, uh, number two, and also the Compensation Reservoir, to name just three. Uh, we've actually got some 19 reservoirs at the top of the hill. Now, it's blatantly, it's blatantly obvious that water management is the business of every single agency uh, that deals with Inverclyde, and thankfully, that is now happening. This SNP government's action by delivering the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act 2009 has actually forced people and organisations to come together, come to the table to actually begin to deal with their own responsibilities. Now, in response to this new legislation, Inverclyde Council commissioned Dutch company Grondmage uh, Consulting, now Sweco, to assess the need for flood alleviation measures, uh, which I welcome. And following the report, which identified numerous priority locations regarding uh, flooding, the Council established a flood action working group with representation from the police, Transport Scotland, Scottish Water, the uh, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, Scottish Natural Heritage, Network Rail, Argyven Estates, Historic Scotland, Amy, and relevant council services. The group produced a costed flood action plan in 2010 in line with the initial allocation of £500,000 for projects designed to alleviate some of the area's flooding problems. And consequently, in 2014, Scottish Water committed £50,000 to the Fox Street area of Greenock 
to improve its wastewater infrastructure and tackle a flooding issue at nearby properties. And in 2016, four Inverclyde schemes received national funding as part of the Scottish Government's flood project scheme, which, costed, uh, uh, which was costed at £1.54 million, of which 80% was contributed by the Scottish Government and the Council funded the remaining 20%. Also at the same time, Member Clyde Council's Central Greenwick Flood Prevention Project was underway with six out of seven works complete, while the four additional locations acquiring measures were at the design stage. It must be noted that this work was largely made possible due to, once again, national funding from this SNP government uh, with, the, with a £1.7 million grant uh, to deal with that project and something which I lobbied hard for and which I was delighted that once again another minister, Paul Wheelhouse MSP, was happy to sign off. Now, presenting also flood prevention and maintenance are vital to help our constituencies and also our communities. And certainly the splendid isolation approach in Inverclyde ended in 2009 thanks to this SNP Scottish Government. And as John Scott MSP said in his earlier comments, this bill has served its purpose well. Thank you very much. We now move to the closing speeches and I call David Stewart up to six minutes, please, Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think this has been a, an excellent debate with thoughtful and insightful contributions from across the Chamber. And with considerable foresight, the business managers scheduled a debate on flooding on a day we've got flooding. And I think they deserve accolade for that. As I learned from SEPA's floodline service this morning, there has been two flood alerts in Scotland, no flood warnings and no severe flood warnings. And I signed up to the floodline alert service personally today and sign off and recommend to all members that they advertise this excellent service for all their constituents. And President Officer, climate change is inevitable. Even if all emissions were stopped tomorrow, the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere would continue to cause damage for years to come. Because of this, future generations face the possibility of severe weather incidents causing flood, misery and destruction unless we act now with adaptation and mitigation. Uh, our communities, particularly the coastal and riverside communities, are already susceptible to flooding and the last few years have faced it with increased frequency and prolonged effects. And as we learned from Lewis MacDonald earlier, it's the poorer um, elements of our society that don't have flood insurance that are more affected with the uh, terrible effects of flooding. But the effects won't be limited to our rural communities. Urban buildings designed to withstand the weather of the past cannot cope with the conditions of the future. So it's vitally important we protect our homes, our buildings, our communities from the effects of flooding. And that must be the fore of our thinking. What can we do to mitigate? What can we do to prevent? Let me give you one example. The Royal Society of Edinburgh uh, looked at research recently and said if there's a 10% increase in precipitation, it can result in halving of the flood return period at Pacific Key on the Clyde. And that's so the likelihood of flooding in one in 100 years would half to one in 50 years. So the whole standards of flood defences would fall. So a, a key step must be in terms of planning permission. So when planning applications for new homes are submitted, SEPA are asked for advice to check for environmental risks, uh, both to the environment and the future of their homes. And yet, their advice against building in floodplain areas has repeatedly been ignored, as we've heard from several members in the debate today. Planning permission granted, building in floodplains take place, and home lives, businesses and schools are turned upside down with flood water. Now, we took evidence in the Clare Committee last September from members of the Adaptation Subcommittee of the Committee on Climate Change, who told us that not all local authorities carry out strategic flood risk assessments when dealing with local development plans. To not look properly at future flood risk seems inherently reckless uh, to me. And in Scotland at the moment, when pressure is put on increased building and flood planes, it's increasingly important that all developers carry out flood risk assessments. So on top of the issues in planning, as we've heard from uh, Mark Ruskell, 90% of at-risk properties are not protected by flood defences. So the responsibility in all of us, developers, local authorities, government and parliament, is to ensure that we do the utmost to protect communities from the tragic consequences of flooding. Presiding officer, perhaps in the wind-up, the Cabinet Secretary could refer to flood warning systems and responses to flood events in her wind-up. The Rural Affairs and Environment Committee report in session three, which I was an occasional substitute and which was convened by the Cabinet Secretary, made very strong recommendations 
on the establishment of 100% high resolution radar coverage throughout Scotland and the lack of pluvial flooding warning systems in Scotland. I would welcome uh, comments from the, from the Cabinet Secretary at that point. Um, I also think it's important in, in the debate to summarise a couple of points and apologise for the members I can't mention. I think the Cabinet Secretary made some excellent points about the good example of flood protection schemes in Elgin and I would endorse as a regional member the points she made about that. I also would agree the points that Edward Mountain made about the crucial issues around measures to slow down water transfer and the real unfortunate combination of flash floods uh, and high tides is a very good point. Claudia Beamish uh, made a, a very relevant point about climate change as a shared international threat, the crucial importance of increasing research uh, and development, and looking at having reliable and consistent, consistent funding for SEPA and the Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, Graeme Day made a very useful point, I think, about FLADRI, about this scheme which will run for 20 years, providing flood cover for those most in need. I think that's an excellent point. And I think what Gillian Martin brought to the debate was the human element by bringing out the flooding in her constituency, the, vid the vivid examples of the long-term aftermaths of flooding, some people being out of their homes uh, for over uh, a year. And with Lewis MacDonald, again, we had other examples of the flooding in Aberdeen, and he made the very important point that 100,000 properties at risk in Scotland, marked also by the points that Mark Ruskell made, which said that although there's 40 flood prevention projects, 90% of the properties uh, are not uh, covered. So in conclusion, uh, President Officer, uh, flooding causes misery, destruction, death and injury. It's crucial that all agencies, SEPA, Scottish Water, uh, work together to reduce flood risk and take a strategic approach to climate change and develop sustainable management of flood risk. Um, as Gilbert White, the leading American geographer of the 20th century, said, floods are an act of God, but flood losses are largely an act of man. Thank you. I call Donald Cameron. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer to farming and crofting in my register of interest? I'm delighted to be able to close for the Scottish Conservatives today on what is an issue plainly of great importance. Flooding is damaging to properties and the environment, but it has a particular impact on the lives of many of our constituents. These include the cost to rebuild a home, the damage to possessions and furnishings, and of course the untold stress on the individuals who suffer. Occasionally and, and tragically, human life is lost. While Scotland is significantly less affected by flooding in comparison to other parts of the UK, it does remain a serious issue, particularly in areas where there are no existing flood defence schemes. And whilst I welcome the consensual tone of this debate, I should, however, note that whilst funding allocated for natural assets and flooding rose in the last budget, we remain conserved, concerned by the overall cut to SEPA's budget. It is all well and good to have the funding in place for flood management, but that work will be undone if one of the primary delivery bodies has its budget squeezed. And we must also acknowledge a similar difficulty for local authorities who are the first port of call for managing flood defences. On a local angle, I know all too well the impact that flooding has on local communities, given the various PVAs, potentially vulnerable areas that exist across the West Highlands and island communities. The idea that the Highlands are not vulnerable to flooding because of the topography of the area would of course be incorrect. Almost all of the major settlements are vulnerable due to their location on the coastline. And the, there are several islands which are all designated as PVA sites, including Butte and Bambecula. Indeed, most of the U.S. are impacted, and many will remember the flooding that hit Stornoway back in 2014. I should also mention the fact that Cool and Lockyside on the shores of Loch Linney near Fort William are regularly affected by floods. Whilst I acknowledge that the government has committed to funding new flood protection projects and support local flood risk management plans, I would be eager to ascertain if any of these new pro projects will be in the West Highlands. At present, there are limited flood defence systems in place and major towns such as Fort William and Oban remain at risk. And of course, many will have seen the news yesterday, I think the Cabinet Secretary mentioned this, uh, that the Met Office issued uh, several flood warnings for areas around Caithness and Sutherland. Uh, and I look forward to working with the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that the Highlands and Islands benefit from new investment into flood defences. Men yes, of course. Claudia Bimish. And I would just like to highlight um, and ask the member if he agrees with me that in relation to the potentially vulnerable areas that he's already raised in, in his closing remarks, that there are a number of smaller communities 
uh, particularly properties with under uh, 50 houses in them, that are being excluded. Um, and, and I think two or three members have raised this. And I wonder if he'd agree with me that it is an important issue for the Scottish Government to address. Donald Cameron. Absolutely. It, it is a, a very serious issue and important uh, and it, that the Government does address that because it's not just the... Uh, we must address all communities, big and small, in, in, in this project. Um, several members have talked about the wider uh, point about climate change, and I think that um, that's incredibly important. The effects of climate change will play a major role in determining our future approach to flood defence strategy and management, and we have to see flood management in that context. With sea levels rising as a result of global warming, we need to do all we can to reduce our carbon footprint, and this means continuing to lead the way in producing renewable technologies and ensure that we minimise the impact of carbon emissions. We need a rounded approach which just does not just focus on reducing emissions in the energy sector but looks at how we reduce our impact in housing and transport, just two of the areas which the recent Committee on Climate Change noted have not seen sufficient strides in reducing uh, carbon footprint. I'd like to spend the rest of my uh, time remarking on some of the points made across the chamber which I found particularly compelling. Edward Mountain uh, spoke of the significance of considering all measures of slowing down water transfer from land to rivers, uh, and that forms part of, of my party's uh, amendment. John Scott, I uh, hope he doesn't take this the wrong way, but having been around longer than many of us, um, spoke about the earlier legislation of this parliament, in particular the 2009 Act. And I think it's incredibly important to see this in a long-term trajectory uh, to build on what we have already achieved in the past. Um, Lewis MacDonald and Mark Ruskell both spoke powerfully about the difficulty that poorer householders uh, have in getting insurance. Uh, and Mark Ruskell um, added to that the, the fact that there is an inter-portfolio aspect to flood management and how it is important to, to um, uh, deal with and, and involve uh, the rural economy um, portfolio as well as simply the environment uh, portfolio. Alexander Burnett was a uh, one of the many Northeast MSPs referring to Storm Frank and made the point that businesses are still rebuilding even now, uh, a reminder of the long term effects of flooding. Graham Day spoke of uh, the number of organisations, the web of stakeholders that, are, that were involved, and there's clearly an issue of coordination. It was a point made by Gillian Martin, too. I think she used the word jigsaw. Um, and she also gave a very evocative case study of her constituency. Uh, and I was struck by the point that she, she made about long-term communication uh, with residents being so important. So to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's clear that while Scotland takes a commanding lead on devising many of uh, the solutions to tackle climate change, there is still more we can do to support communities and limit the havoc that flooding can cause. We welcome many of the steps that the government has taken. We remain concerned over cuts to SEPA, which of course delivers vital services. And whilst we are unable to prevent every natural incident, it should not make us complacent in our approach to minimising the outcomes and responding to the challenges that flooding presents. Thank you. I call Rosanna Cunningham to wind up the debate. If you could take us to five o'clock, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to uh, thank all members for their contributions to the... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd Start like, again, please, I'd like to thank all members for the contributions to the debate, uh, all of which I heard more clearly than you obviously heard my opening sentence. Um, I probably ought to at this point move the motion in my name, which I omitted to do in my opening speech, and uh, to indicate that I'm simply upset accepting both amendments uh, um, uh, today, which does not mean that I agree with absolutely everything that I've heard from every member in this debate. Um, but I think the, the, the debate has highlighted the interest in flood risk management and potential impacts uh, in uh, communities across Scotland. Uh, and indeed, um, the parliamentary business manager was clearly quite prophetic in choosing to allocate today for the debate, uh, given the flooding events that have taken place overnight. I mean, obviously reducing the likelihood of these potentially devastating events is why reducing flood risk has to be a priority uh, for the government. The debate has highlighted that good progress has been made in reducing the level of flood risk in Scotland. And I, I just need to reiterate what an enormous difference there is now compared to what pre-existed before that legislation 
uh, was brought into being. We now have our first set of flood risk plans based on strategic evidence as to the causes of flooding and the likely locations where it will occur. That didn't exist before. The first six year plans were published last year and the challenge and opportunity is to implement them and deliver the benefits. At times the debate did reach out into other portfolio interests and I sense my diary filling up with bilaterals uh, if I take up all of the suggestions that uh, came from various parts of the chamber but I suppose an early warning ought to go out to both Derek uh, Mackay and Kevin Stewart uh, the finance and planning uh, uh, ministers uh, respectively. Um, I want to go through some of the contributions that we had uh, um, that we um, heard from Edward Mountain talked about hard engineering not always be suitable absolutely I, I absolutely agree with him how, how could anybody not um, he raised big questions about land use issues but of course he knows how in, amazingly controversial they can be um, and and in a sense that land use issue is a subject a whole, subject of a whole separate debate um, on, on its own and, and land use issues were referred to by a number of other members as well so I'll have a little think about whether or not there's a way to to come uh, forward with a, a different way of looking at these issues like flooding um, and others. So I need to speak to some of my colleagues about that because land use covers so many different areas. It's difficult to encapsulate it in a single debate. Claudia Beamish raised a lot of issues um, which also relate to those bigger land use uh, questions. Um, uh, she talked about costs as well. Uh, and I just would make the point of the, the, the Scottish Government COSLA agreement um, which secured consistent funding over the whole of the period 2016 to 2026. I mean, I know that there will never be enough money to do everything we want to do. The point about this was the consistency, the ability to plan forward over that long period of time. Again, that didn't exist uh, uh, previously. Um, and uh, I ought to say that uh, as part of the review of planning, the Scottish Government is considering the issue of permitted development rights, which was a particular thing that she uh, was concerned about. And we've commissioned sustainability appraisal in this regard. That will inform work on uh, detailed proposals for future consultation. Can I just say to those who raised the issue about SEPA, um, the Chief Executive, uh, Terry Ahern, is absolutely clear that flood risk management and flood warning work will continue to be an organisational priority and delivered through the available budget. And that's a specific promise made uh, by uh, the Chief Executive. Uh, a number of uh, members, including Graham Day, talked about flood re and some of the issues uh, around insurance, which continues to be a challenge, I accept that. Um, I think it's important to say that as useful as flood re is, it will operate till 2039, which seems like a long way away, but is not perhaps just as long as everybody thinks. That is to give notice to householders and house builders to build in and ensure resilience and protection. It is not something that is going to be there in perpetuity. So I think it's important that we remember that. John Scott raised, as many others did, yes. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Simply to uh, ask the Cabinet Secretary if she acknowledges that this issue of insurance is a particular issue for lower income households and in particular for tenants in private rental property. Rosanna Cunningham. Very much so as I'm aware in my own constituency and, and uh, I know that as much good work as Floodry is doing they have not yet reached everybody and there is still an issue out there in respect of insurance that needs to be dealt with. Um, John Scott and others raised the coastal erosion issue. I, I am indeed very well aware of the problem but that is why so much is currently being done uh, in order to assess the uh, likely extent of the damage. And I think it's important to remind people that erosion and flooding are not necessarily, coastal erosion, coastal flooding are not necessarily the same thing. They are interlinked, but they're not exactly the same thing. And flooding aspects of coastal erosion will be applicable uh, to flood funding. There will be uh, funding uh, for that. No, I need to press on if I'm to do justice to the, uh, to the rest of the debate. Um, a number of other members, uh, including Gillian Martin um, and others, uh, talked about the impact of flooding on individuals and communities. I think that's an important thing that we keep in mind. Uh, communities are at the very heart of this. Individual householders are the very heart of this because this is where it hits them uh, most. Um, she also flagged up, again back to the land use issue, the, the concern around peat and wetlands. 
um, and that is a big and important issue when it comes to any kind of development, uh, not just uh, flood risk management. Um, others uh, talked about uh, um, small communities, and I ought to say um, to those who did, that was Mark Rusko, Claudia Beamish, perhaps Bruce Crawford and others, um, that the second national flood risk assessment, which is currently underway, um, follows a revised methodology that does <coughs> seek to include small communities that have significant flood risk. So it is an issue that we are aware of uh, and concerned to try and do something uh, about. Um, uh, presiding officer, I'm concerned that I am, have probably missed out uh, mentioning a number of people who contributed to this debate uh, and a number of issues that uh, could well have been uh, raised uh, by me. Uh, the one I do want to just come to is uh, Oliver Mundell's concern about White Sands. Um, as he knows, um, there is an inquiry uh, uh, which will now take place about that, and it was precisely because of the number of disputed facts that there were in that. There really isn't any other way for us to proceed than to do this inquiry. Uh, and as long uh, as it might take, it is better doing it and getting it sorted out than not. Um, I hope you will agree with that. Um, I, I do caution some members as I said at the outset, that we cannot go back to the previous ad hoc way flood projects were dealt with, which is what some of them would lead us towards if we move away from the framework that we have uh, set down. The change in climate does present us uh, with challenges in the future that require continued partnership working involving local authorities, SEPA, Scottish Water um, and others. And flood risk management is a key component of the suite of measures that this government has to prepare Scotland for that changing climate. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes our debate on reducing flood risk. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9054 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now and I would call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that motion 9054 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 9052 on approval of an SSI. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion? Moved. Thank you very much. So we come to decision time. The first question is that amendment 9019.1 in the name of Edward Mountain, which seeks to amend motion 9019 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on working in partnership to reduce flood risk across Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion, that amendment 9019.2 in the name of Claudia Beamish, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of the Minister be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 9019 in the name of Rosanna, Rosanna Cunningham as amended is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 9052 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And that concludes decision time. We move to members' business in the name of Elaine Smith. We'll just take a few moments for members to change their seats.